All right, so we're going to do extra oral imaging, chapter 23. Uh, this chapter is going to be super fast, so uh, I don't expect you to um, memorize any of the information that I give you here. Uh, even your book, it talks about, it starts on page 260. Um, it does talk about how dental hygienists, for the most part, we don't do any of these images you're going to see in this chapter. Excuse me. So. Um, you don't really need to know these kinds of things. I think it's a good idea to at least show you what it looks like. I think that you should watch this video. Um, you know, I might reference something like this later, but uh, for the most part, it's not something that you're gonna you're gonna be tested on. So the learning objectives would be to define the key terms, to describe the purpose and use, to describe the equipment, and to detail the equipment and patient preparations necessary for each of these exposures. We're not gonna do each of we're not gonna do all of that. Uh, these are what I would like you to do, is to be able to identify the purpose and to be able to identify the projection itself. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to understand or to describe the head position and the receptor placement uh, for the beam alignment for each of the following, but I do expect you to at least uh, kind of understand which of these which is which. So there's a lateral jaw projection, which includes the body of the mandible and the lateral jaw projection, ramus of the mandible. Uh, there is a lateral cephalometric projection, a posterior anterior projection, the waters projection, submento vertex projection, the reverse town projection, and transcranial projection. The purpose of this chapter is to expose you to some of this information. So we want to present the basic concepts of these extraoral images, and we're going to introduce a number of extraoral projection techniques and describe uh, how each of those work. The purpose and the use of each of these uh, images is to evaluate large areas of the skull or jaws, to evaluate growth and development, to evaluate impacted teeth, to detect diseases, lesions, and conditions of the jaw, to examine the extent of large lesions, and to evaluate trauma, and to evaluate the temporomandibular joint area. Everything except for that last one are all also done with the panoramic uh, image. Only the temporomandibular joint area has an additional x-ray that uh, is better than the, the pano, uh, that it does things other than the pano can do. So that's, that's the only one different from chapter 22. The extraoral projection techniques include the lateral jaw imaging, the skull imaging, and the temporomandibular joint imaging. The lateral jaw imaging includes uh, the body of the mandible projection and the ramus of the mandible projection. There's two different ones. They're taken exactly the same way. This one right here shows us the body of the mandible. And if I were to kind of zoom in on and take another one of just, uh, here I'll show you with this, uh, just sort of this area right here, then I would have a ramus of the mandible projection. It's taken the exact same way and it's used for the same purposes. And so for this, we're looking to see if there is any issues with the jaw. For skull imaging, there are a couple. So it's going to be used to examine the bones of the face and the skull. It's used most often in oral surgery and for orthodontics. It includes the lateral cephalometric projection, the posterior anterior projection, the waters projection, sub mento vertex projection, and the reverse town projection. All right, so the first step is the cephalometric, or it's sometimes called the lateral cephalometric projection. Uh, both of them are, are the same. Then uh, it, it almost looks exactly the same as your lateral jaw projection, right? Only for this, it's taken uh, without an angle. So the, the PID is exactly at zero degrees versus the lateral jaw, which is taken at an angle. But anyway, uh, the the cephalometric is used to determine uh, where the bone placement is uh, in order to get a, uh, a profile. So you guys are probably learning in preclinic how we measure patients' profiles, that we look to see uh, if the patient's profile is correct, right? We're looking to see if the bottom jaw sticks out too far, which would give us a class three occlusion, which would be prognathic. We're looking to see if the bottom jaw is too far in with a severe underbite or overbite, sorry. And uh, that would be a class two, either a division one or a division two. And, uh, you know, we would be looking to see that the patient is, um, is uh, 
retrognathic, and then if the patient is like this, uh, beautiful soul, then they are mesognathic, which means that their jaws come together in the, the correct way. So anyway, the purpose of the cephalometric is to evaluate the facial growth and development, to look for trauma, and to look for diseases and developmental abnormalities. All right, and so this is what it would look like if we were to place a receptor either directly in front of the patient's face or directly behind the patient's face, and we were to take uh, a radiograph just of that one shot. So uh, posterior, anterior, uh, it actually means from the back to the front, right? So the, to take this radiograph specifically, we would need to have the receptor placed directly in front of the patient's face, like kind of up against their nose. And then you uh, just kind of, you sort of place the PID from the back looking at them. It does the same thing everyone else does, or all of the other projections do. So it evaluates facial growth, development, trauma, and disease, and developmental abnormalities. This one is the waters projection. It's taken at an angle. You can see kind of from underneath the patient's jaw. And uh, the purpose of this one is actually to evaluate the maxillary sinus area. This one gives us an angle of the sinuses where we'll be uninterrupted by all of the other bones uh, of the face. And so what's really nice is you can see these sinus areas much clearer than you are able to see them in some of the other uh, images that we take. Um, sometimes it, it might be, you know, you're able to see the sinus, but uh, there, there are ghost images or there's a double image or, uh, you know, sometimes the other, like especially in a pano, the hard palate can sometimes get in the way of being able to accurately look at the sinus. And so this is a wonderful projection for sinus issues, especially here in San Antonio. So many people have sinus problems in San Antonio. The submento vertex projection, as the name implies, it's taken from underneath the mental uh, projection here. So it, we're looking up at them from underneath their, uh, their chin. And so you can see the entire occipital area here. And then you can see this is where the jaw starts right here. But then you can see all of this extra stuff here where the, the jaw um, the mandible actually articulates with the temporal bones, and you can see some of those other bones in there too. Um, this one is to identify the purpose of the condyles, to demonstrate the base of the skull, and to evaluate fractures of the zygomatic arch. This one's really nice because you can see these zygomatic arches really beautifully as they come up and articulate with the temporal bone. And then the reverse town projection. This one's wonderful at identifying fractures of the condylar neck and the ramus area. This one is taken almost sort of exactly like the posterior anterior one. Um, however, the patient's mouth is open, as you can see. Um, and so it's, it's taken at a little bit of an angle. So we're not like directly on the way we are with the other, but um, we can see this really beautiful angle right here as the patient is open. Um, and as we know, you know, when our patient opens, the jaw not only um, it not only you know moves open, but it also glides forward. It has a hinge and glide motion. And so when they open like that, we're able to see this is actually more of the back part right here. And then this, because it's you know three dimensional, two dimensional object thing, um, we're actually seeing the front of the the condo the coronoid process, sorry, uh, right here in the front. And so this is really beautiful at trying to figure out if there are any fractures or damage to the, the condyle and the ramus. All right, I didn't put the pictures in here, but if you turn to page 271 all the way at the bottom, you'll see the um, the some of those images for in, in figure 23-11b, you'll see that transcranial view of the temporomandibular joint in the rest position. Um, and so the temporomandibular joint imaging, they actually kind of just like look like blobs to me. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to read them. Uh, there are specialists out there who work with just TMJs and, and being able to diagnose um, TMD or temporomandibular uh, joint dysfunction. Um, and so these are images they, uh, they look at the joint, which is where the temporal bone and the mandible meet. And then they look at the glenoid fossa and the articulate eminence of the temporal bone, the condyle of the mandible, and the articular disc between the bones, which compromises the TMJ, or the temporomandibular joint. It includes the transcranial projection and the temporomandibular joint tomography. And so figure 23-11 has the transcranial um, 
projection. And then if you turn the page to 272, you'll see the uh, figure 23-12, which has the uh, the tomography, the temporomandibular joint tomography images there. And it's they're really hard to read. I mean, they just look like blobs. So I'm really glad I'm not a, a TMJ specialist because um, yeah, that's a tough situation to be in. So um, what you can you can kind of make out the the mandible as it kind of goes up and touches the the temporal bone, but but uh, yeah. Anyway, that is the end of this. If you have questions on any of these, um, I would really like for you to refer to chapter 23 just as just as a reference chapter. It's something that, you know, years from now, uh, maybe a question comes up about some type of extra oral imaging and you want to check it out. And so you can use this chapter of your book, maybe mark it uh, to go back and look at it another day uh, years from now. And um and look at it again because I think that it's wonderful to come back to and see, you know, after you've had a lot of experience looking at panoramics, but it's really not something that you as a hygienist will have to uh, know on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, save this chapter for, you know, those special interests kind of things.